Good afternoon and welcome to this fifth session of the business content at the 60th Monte Carlo Television Festival. Coming to you live from the Principality of Monaco, we're bringing you a hybrid format, both in person and online, with our virtual participants. We have three this afternoon in this session for you. For you joining us on Zoom, the festival biz content includes an exceptional lineup of legendary showrunners, international producers and industry executives who are all shaping the future of television. Today, we have two sessions lined up for you. The first one is Weathering Unprecedented Times in Television, the shape of international co-productions to come. We've got a great lineup, um, as I told you. And um, this afternoon, later on at six, eight o'clock, uh, no, sorry, six o'clock CEST, there's so many time zones, and um, five o'clock in the British summertime, we have the next panel, which is upending the global film distribution model the migration from movie theatre to streaming. So don't forget to come back for that. And we'll be sure you'll really enjoy this engaging programme we have. All week we've been doing intimate one-on-ones, inspirational keynotes and these engaging panel discussions. We'll be inter inter um, addressing international content creation, production, the shift in digital, the continuing impact of the pandemic and of course a lot more. And we're looking forward to all of your expert insights and sharing everything you know with us to our attendees both here and of course online uh, throughout the session. So anybody who is with us, see we have a few people joining us. This is coming up on Zoom. Please feel free to let us know where you're from. Yeah, there's quite a few. Let us know where you're from. Um, you can, in the chat box, you can ask questions because we will be asking a few questions at the end of the session. You can even upvote if you'd like to do, to do so. I know a couple of names in there, so please do join us. That will be great. And um, I think that's about it for me. So I am going to hand you over to our fantastic moderator Moderator Alessandra de Tomasi, who's an entertainment journalist and the founder of Air Quotes, and she's a long-term um, festival. Uh, she's a member of the family of pre-selection committee, and uh, we've known her a long-time friend of the festival. So, Alessandra, over to you. Thank you so much, Joanna. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alessandra Tommasi. I have the pleasure to introduce you this amazing guest this afternoon. Next to me, we have Teresa Fernandez Valdez, executive producer and co founder of Bamboo Co Producciones. <laughs> Next to her, we have Moritz Polter, producer of the Newborn with Light Pictures with ITV Studios. Welcome. And joining us via Zoom, we have Frank Spotnitz, CEO and executive producer of Big Light Produ Productions, sorry, <laughs> and Vance Van Patten, Van Patten, hi, former national executive director and CEO of Producers Guild of America, welcome. And last but not least, Grant Kesman, global TV agent of Creative Artists Agency. Welcome everyone, hi. Hello. I would like to start with all of you asking how, in your opinion, has changed the landscape of international productions? I mean, how is this different from the past in your own experience? We, may we start here? Oh, I, can, I can start. I'm happy to start. Well, I think that, that obviously um, one thing that has drastically changed is that it's far easier nowadays to have access to programs from all over the world and to see what uh, what comes out of individual countries that we were otherwise not able to do, um, especially because of the um, Netflix and Amazons of the world that are um, not just producing there, but also buying up program that is then becoming very accessible for, for each one of us. And I think that is, um, a, you know, a great trend because it, uh, I think, brings the world closer together. Um, but it also means that um, you know we get more influenced by others, other people's work, and uh, that's fantastic and interesting. 
let's talking about other people's job you have worked together with one of other panelists via zoom frank spotnitz you have been together for uh, crossing lines yes so you, you have john forces before this panel hi frank would you like to add something to that yeah no i completely agree with more it's more said there, there's more ways to uh, create programming and to view programming from all over the world than there have ever been uh, there's more competition than there's ever been and so i think it's it's the audience has been sliced into a million different little slices and there's something for everyone and actually the challenge now i think is being found is is just because there's so much choice making yourself stand out from the crowd is is uh is, is the the difficulty but it's a it's a very welcome one you know it's a it's a good problem to have and i i'm sure that theresa agree with that yes for sure it's i think it's is it's a very very nice moment for our industry um imagine also that now we are all at home you cannot move all for the last year so i think um it was like the moment to find as 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 our colleague suggests is to find you because there's more movement than before. I know that it's very, very clear now that the big bet is the TV or the series, yeah. uh, and you can you can find content everywhere and coming from everywhere. Uh, so the the strong thing is to to have a call, of course, to to ha to take the light that you need yeah. in order to present your content. But the people is looking for more than before. So I think now the, 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 the difficulty comes because you are going to compete with big budgets, maybe coming yeah. from US or big markets. And maybe in my case, I'm coming from Spain. And of course, we have now the big, big names and the big platforms also in our country. But it's true that it's very difficult for me to compete with Games of Thrones or something yeah. like that. These strong brands coming also for, from Marvel or this kind of show. So uh, I think that the key here is to find where you can be strong or where you can be different and not try to be uh, like the others are because yeah. trying to compete in the same way is going to be so difficult to get uh, success of course i have assumed that all the audience know very well who you are but maybe since we are talking about the competition teresa and also all our uh, panelists can say a few words about your work because it was it's been remarkable on spain but internationally also if i'm what? if you can share with us a few words about your own experience your own company uh, yeah, for sure. Um, we are producing right now different shows for different uh, platforms. For Amazon, we are doing now a show uh, with Aura Garrido and Jean Renault. This is a good example how we can bring one talent coming from outside to our country. Jean Renault came to Spain to shoot this series and maybe next year we're going to launch that show. But also Apple, they were looking for shows in Spanish and they came to Spain to, to ask for a new show and we are producing right now a show for them. The name is Now and Then and we're doing it uh, between Madrid and Miami. Also, this new opportunity gives us the time that we're living now because before it was impossible yeah. to imagine that we can do a big big show between Spain and and, and Miami in that case we had a mix of cultures there because yeah. uh, we're telling a story about different people in the university and we have Colombian people Spanish people American people working together so this is a good example about and it's not the first well, one yeah. because you have been you have set a record before before because your company has done the first Netflix original yeah. Spanish show and it's an international global success. Yeah, uh, las chicas del, del, del cable. Cablos? Yeah, del cable. Del cable. Yes, uh, our company cable girls uh, produced for, for the local TV in Spain two two titles that travel very well before to have the experience with Netflix. They were. Um, Gran Hotel and Velvet and both of them 
at the end of the travel goes to Netflix and they prove that it was still working very well in different countries. So they asked us to have something similar of that, but of course an original for Netflix. So we were the first company to work with them and the title was Las Chicas del Cable and it was so, so successful. So and successful. International appealing. Yeah, so it was a, a female world. Yeah. and uh, trying to defend their own spirit and their freedom and they and we connect through this story with three generations grandmother mothers and 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 granddaughters so they share together the the show and it was uh, a big brand also for netflix in spain and and in the latin american countries also i know in france work very well i think they are nodding here in the room, so I'm, I'm <laughs> sure it is. But Moritz, we were talking about the newborn company, and of course your experience go back for many decades. So <laughs> can you share decades with us already. some? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, <laughs> you are right. In a good way. Yeah, yeah, you're no, you're very right. Well, but, um, let's say I that. Mean, if for me, the last, uh, the last five years, I mean, before I worked with Frank, uh, after, after I had worked with Frank, I, uh, I, I um, started at Bavaria Fiction, where I was for mm -hmm. the last uh, five and a half years, and, and there I built their international slate. Um, they hadn't done international shows for a while, and mm -hmm. they hired me to, to build up the slate there, and so I tried, and I did, um, uh, it's not as big as the first Netflix uh, show, but we did the first show for Telekom in Germany, which was interesting because it was a completely new uh, buyer. And, and we did that as a co-production with Amazon in France, which was also interesting, you know, mixing uh, two streamers uh, with yeah. each other, which uh, I think, um, yeah, it was, it was a challenge, but also uh, fun. And, uh, and then I, I did uh, Das Boot, which, um, you know, premiered in, in a lot of different countries, but it wasn't uh, with, a, with a streamer, it was with Sky uh, predominantly in, in Europe and uh, with Stars Play here in France and in the US it was uh, with Hulu. Mm -hmm. So um, that was uh, bringing together different platforms again, um, which, which I think uh, worked really, really well because then it was standout program for them. Yeah. Um, and so the marketing um, was there for, for the show. And um, yeah, I did Freud for, for Netflix, but again, it wasn't just for Netflix, it was uh, for the Austrian public broadcaster. Yeah. And um, then for, for Netflix, and it will also have a life on the German public broadcaster so after it's Netflix. It's like a <laughs> so, hybrid experiment. Um, it's, it's, it's always interesting because that way you reach far greater audiences yeah. because if you only have the streamer, yeah, exactly. you have a very global reach, but with the public broadcasters in yeah. the individual countries, you have uh, you know, far more eyeballs yes. watching your program. And um, I mean, uh, you know, F Frank was saying that earlier, it's, it's really hard to compete and to be seen. Yeah. And uh, so um, being able to be seen on a uh, public broadcaster or, or any terrestrial um, uh, channel helps get watched. And at the end of the day, we are, you know, content makers. We want yeah. people to see our content. So it's really nice when that happens. It's amazing how this land, landscape is changing. Grant, you have been moved to, um, from Los Angeles to London, so you can tell both sides of the stories. Because uh, as you can, uh, if you can tell us a little bit more, you represent a lot of storytellers in television and not only in television. Can you tell, some, tell, 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 tell us something about your work and also your own experience on international production? Yeah, so I've been I've been here in London uh, for two years. I've been at CA for 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, but a big I, I I changed my focus to to focus on Europe and and the rest of the world as as Netflix and Amazon and all these U.S. global streamers came into the business and wanted to find shows outside the U.S. I got very interested in. I always make the analogy like I'm at a party and I'm talking to Netflix and all of a sudden they're looking over my shoulder at somebody else and I want to know. Who, the, who, the, who they're looking at. And to me, that was the global marketplace. So I, I really mm -hmm. um, got excited to, to, to try something new. And, and I really think what everyone that's on this panel is doing, you know, mm -hmm. in Europe is the future in, in a way that things have already been happening, but it's only going to become, it's only becoming more and more significant. The budgets are going up. The, the creative is getting better. The amount of people who are seeing these shows has, has amplified. And that to me just makes this 
the most exciting part of the TV business right now outside the United States. Um, but yes, my job is, is, is to um, help producers, help creatives here in Europe in particular um, to, to find great projects that we can either sell to the global streamers or that we can be helpful with uh, as co-production. So two examples, recent examples. One, um, Scott Frank is a client he came to us with Tom Fontana. They have a script called Monsieur Spade, which is based on um, the character Sam Spade, most famously played by Humphrey Bogart in, um, in The Maltese Falcon. So they came to us and said, hey, we, we have a script. It's 20 years after The Maltese Falcon. It's set in the south of France. We want to we wanna make this as authentically French as possible, even though there's a, a main character who's American. What can we do? And, and so we brought the project to uh, OE Corps in France, who have been phenomenal. Um, and we're currently out to the marketplace. We, we have recently attached Clive Owen to star as Sam Spade. Um, and it's an amazing project that's going to be, you know, both in English and in French that, that Tom and Scott are super excited by. And that, you know, it's, it's to me, it's, it's the future of like, hey, we're not, we're not only helping people and producers in their territory, but we're also bringing in IP that's getting noticed because I think it's come up a couple times of hey there's so much content how do you stand out and a big part of what we're doing is to help supply either intellectual property actors high-end talent high-end directors to projects so they're not only elevated in the minds of, of the buyers but also for the audiences as well there's that familiarity to having Clive Owen in the show or yeah. I'm working on another project with Gerard Butler um, that we've taken to the UK market and attached our client Howard Overman and his company Urban Myth Films to um, based on a huge film franchise um, that Gerard stars in called the, we, we call it the Has Fallen film franchise. So you have London Has Fallen, Olympus Has Fallen, Angel Has Fallen. These are really, really, I mean, the, as a cum, I think they've made over half a billion dollars at the World Wide Box Office. So, and there's a desire to do a TV show that kind of complements the movies. So we're in the middle of that and we're, we're in negotiations with the global streamer on that. So just kind of my job is just kind of to be that bridge to help mm -hmm. to help producers here and creatives here um, either get attention and, and find great projects that we can bring to the global streamers or, again, figure out ways where we can put the pieces together on a, on a co-production that will really make an impact. Speaking of co-productions and international productions that has made and are making an impact globally speaking, Frank Spotnitz can add absolutely a lot of experience on the topic. I know that you don't need any introduction, but if you will be kind enough to share with us some of your uh, projects and also your, your idea about this, to this topic on conversation. Yeah, I mean... I came, believe it or not, I came to Europe 11 years ago, and it was a completely different world 11 years ago. Um, and I decided to stay, and so I started my company, Big Light, eight years ago, just in time for the first wave of co-productions, like Crossing Lines, one of the shows that Moritz and I did together. Um, and it's, it's unrecognizable now, the state of, of uh, television in Europe versus 11 years ago, and much, much better. There's much more diversity, much more opportunity. Um, I think um, what's been interesting to me is, first of all, realizing the best kinds of international shows are actually local shows. You know, so that's what I was saying. Well, I learned from Crossing Lines, which was a really hard show to do because it was sort of the old fashioned way of trying to assemble pieces from all the different territories in order to sell it in all the territories. And it's hard to make that kind of show feel like it belongs to anybody. It feels like it's kind of belongs to everybody and therefore it doesn't belong to anybody in particular. And so for me, shows like, you know, I've done with our partners Lux Vide in Rome the last five years, you know, we did three seasons of the Medici. Uh, we've just done Leonardo, which is now um, on France television in the fall. And it's, on, it's been in, in Spain and uh, RTV in Spain and it's on Rye. It's, on Amazon in the UK and Ireland, um, and it's been a big success. It's it's local to Italy, but it's a it's a story that reaches everywhere, um, and that feels like creatively, it's much easier to sink your teeth into that kind of approach for these big big international shows. Um, it was also interesting. I should just touch upon is is the way of working, 
which I think, you know, when I came to the UK and, and what Big Light has done is we've used writer's rooms as well as individual authored pieces. And there's been a professionalization of the approach to writing television in Europe um, that is very exciting. And I've been teaching for the last eight years at Serialize in Berlin, teaching 12 writers across Europe, you know, for the last eight years, uh, how to collaborate, how to work in a writer's room, how to learn how to be a showrunner, which means being a producer as well as a writer, which I think is a really valuable thing. So you're seeing the way of working in Europe is changing and evolving and getting stronger. And then the other challenge to all of this opportunity is how you get it right with streaming versus traditional broadcasters. Because streaming obviously offers this unbelievable reach, but if your show is owned entirely by a streaming platform, there is no back end for you as an independent producer like I am. And so the traditional broadcasters, if you can put it together that way, it's still advantageous for you as an independent producer, or if you can do it as a mix of traditional and streaming. So these are all the, uh, the variables that uh, independent producers like me are, are, are looking at these days. I'm sure that Vance has a lot to say about it because speaking of a different world, you have been working for a lot amount of time for the, the most important US majors such as Universal and Paramount and now the, uh, there are new players and the, the landscape is totally changing. Would you like to add something about it? Uh, yeah, I think this is the, possibly one of the most exciting times we've ever experienced because what's fortunately happened is that the American public has finally woken up to being very receptive to international programming and to foreign languages and to the cultures throughout the world. I mean, for years and years, the uh, studios were very successful in selling their pro products internationally. But what you're seeing is now this, uh, this acceptance by American public, by the American public to international um, uh, productions um, or even productions done in locations all over the world. As long as the stories, as Frank so correctly says, are local in their feel and in their story, but the cultural story is universal. And what luckily has happened finally is the American public's wake, woken up. Um, it's an overused word right now, but they're woke, which is good because <laughs> for the first time you've seen, I mean, the one area you never saw happen before is they always said comedy doesn't travel. Well, the first time ever, uh, a foreign comedy series won the Emmy this last year. Schitt's Creek is produced in Canada as a Canadian show. And then you might think that Canada and US are treated normally the same or similar, but it's not. They've never been at this kind of exception where you see the American public really getting into a comedy produced in a foreign country. And it's just indicative of what um, for finally the American public was awake and saying, uh, you know what, this is some really good programming and the cultural stories really have resonance now Absolutely. And speaking of global market, I'm sure that Grant can tell us a little bit more about the process. How do you put together, for instance, shows to fit in a global market? And now it's, it is different from local needs, yeah, local I mean, I, stories. Well, I, I, a lot of the producers that we work with here in Europe, you know, what, what we will do is say, hey, you know, we're American. We're not, you know, when it comes to your your linear network in Germany or France or Spain, like you know them better than we do. Like that's your business. That's, we're not trying to come in and pretend like we, we know that business better than you. Um, but what we do say is, hey, when it comes to the US global streamers who are in territory, who have come to, to, to buy product and buy projects from you, um, you know, we push our clients and even non-clients to what, what are the, you know, what are the projects female led stories are very obviously significant and, and um, important to global streamers. Diverse stories, things based on IP, um, contemporary stories. Like I, there's just such, there's just such a desire because I think there's so much happening in culture right now. We're experiencing together that, that, that a lot of the global streamers want content that reflects what's happening, a story that's happening currently in that country that would resonate with current issues in that country. 
Um, and lastly, I think there's just, you know, in order to stand out, I think a lot of these global streamers are looking for projects that have real attitude towards them. So, you know, they're not, you know, they're going to buy a contemporary love story or a contemporary detective story, but how is it going to be different than something you're going to see on TF1 or ProSieben or any other local network? So that's, to me, the word attitude, attitude and authenticity, I think, are very important when selling to global streamers. So us, when, when working with, with producers and being that strategic consultant that, that we are here in, 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 in Europe, um, it's a combination of that for the local market, as well as, you know, is there a project that goes beyond beyond your borders? And that's where the co-production aspect comes in as well. How are how can we help find other networks, not just in Europe, but but specifically in the U.S., who might come on board and and be and find a, a even if it is in German or if it's mostly in German or half in German, how can we how can we use our resources, our access, um, and our knowledge? you know, not just on what people want, but also on deals to help make the creative and the business side better for producers. That, that's, that's a big focus for us here. Same kind of contemporary stories that we are talking about with Teresa, because you are producing this kind of story and they are sold worldwide. And in your opinion, what's the biggest challenge of join forces and organize producers from different countries because you supervise also some producers and put together the energies of them um it's the more my experience comes more like uh, following our different series when we are when we are uh, shooting in spain but also outside so abroad sometimes we now i think that the, the market is growing and you have more opportunities to have more ambitious shows so uh, you can imagine now that you're going to shoot not just in madrid or just in the north of spain you can travel so now uh, we're shooting for example in, in miami uh, or before in panama and uh, when we do that kind of things of course you, you need to supervise everything how is your show in spain how is your show outside because we are not pending on another co-product co-producer we, we don't have a partner there we is you there so it's more a service but you you you're going to bring of course the the heads of the most important departments to that country and you need to adjust your knowledge and your your um, know-how to the country and the specific things of the country for example for me it's really uh, it was so so hard to learn and i'm still learning about the miles of unions that us have so in terms of <laughs> actors, producers, the, 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 the tracks is, I don't know, but always when I take a, like a new step, it's like, for sure I'm wrong, for <laughs> sure. Because it's impossible to understand, it's so far from us and from our culture. Yeah. So uh, you have the chance to go there to do a big show, but you need to learn a lot of things. So when you are budgeting, for example, one show, you are budgeting under your experience. Maybe you're going to check with some people different things, but it's like in the second minute you are you 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 are fault. It's 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 is the industry is is different now, and and you have new opportunities, but you need to adjust and to learn and to and to lead and drive because always when you are the producer and the showrunner, the people is looking at you, is staring at you, is you have the solution, you are the red phone, so you 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 need to control and manage that. So we are learning on the time all the time so it's to supervise that kind of things is very important because sometimes you send your your team there uh, but if the experience is not good or for example right now it's raining uh, in a strong way in Miami how to manage that how we can do this and how we can get more days so how we can explain to Apple that this is happening but this is not because of your fault it's because of the weather so it's, it's all the time or my experience is is to produce of course to 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 lead shows in Spain in an easy way because I have the experience before yeah. but abroad is is different and and it's hard but it's so nice also because you are growing with them absolutely sure that Moritz agree with that we were talking about Germany before but 
Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, to, to be honest, I, I have very rarely shot in Germany, uh, apart from my, my very, very early career. Um, I've, I've predominantly shot abroad, whether that's uh, in the Czech Republic or in, you know, in um, South Africa or Canada or, uh, yeah, Malta for the last couple of years, a couple of times in France, but, but very rarely actually um. at home. Um, but then, you know, I think what you're saying is, is right. You need to, you need to, uh, you know, bring the heads of departments uh, wherever you're going. And um, it, it's obviously best if, if your heads of departments have worked internationally so that you can have, in my opinion, an international working environment, which everyone kind of adopts to. And depending on what kind of crew you have, meaning what level they are at, they will all have worked in that type of environment before. And then, um, you know, my experience is that it, that it works much better. Um, I think the question that uh, one of the questions that we were talking about earlier of uh, uh, global or local uh, shows, I think that also, I think what, what is key is, is the view from which you are coming. And I think that's, that's what, what Frank also said. Like, I mean, the sport definitely is an international show. The first season, the first two seasons don't even play in Germany. There's no, no German homeland that, that uh, you know, our actors have ever been in. Yes, they've been in the U-boat and they are all German, so it's a German show, but they, you know, they start in France and, uh, you know, second season, I mean, they, they go to America. It's like, uh, you know, these are international shows, but they are created with one vision and yeah. not with multiple um, networks having different opinions trying to pull you in one direction or the other direction and i think uh, you know the the aspect of um one person really leading a show and making sure it's got you know one vision rather than multiples yeah. is is key in order to be able to sell internationally sure that frank can add his own experience because um you have experience in both sides in co-productions and international international productions so i was wondering since some regions offer offers some incentives in order to shoot in their location and to showcase their territory in your opinion this is something that can help the producers or sometimes there are two strings attached and you prefer another way it, it can be helpful, absolutely, you know, because you can get more money on screen. But it just sort of picking up on what Moritz said is, you know, it has to begin with this creative vision, this mm -hmm. urgent creative vision that somebody really loves the story and is desperate to tell the story. And I think that's the challenge we face, especially, you know, with the traditional linear broadcasters, is that you're trying to marshal the resources to tell big shows big stories that can compete with, you know, the budgets of the streamers. And you need to therefore partner with other broadcasters, but do it in a way that preserves a singular creative vision, that it doesn't become, you know, um, a committee that's deciding what the creative is in order to take advantage of tax credits in order to please multiple broadcasters. And, and I did experience that when I first came to Europe. I had a few shows where it was like, it's very, very hard to hang on to what you love in the center of the show because there's so many voices, you know, talking in your ear. Um, but I think like the show that we've just done, that Big Light did most recently, which was Leonardo, which was the first greenlit show from the Alliance. Um, I, I was very encouraged by that experience because, you know, the Alliance is France television um, in France, Rai in Italy, ZDF in Germany. In this case, ZDF didn't uh, participate, but then RTV in, Sp in Spain did. And it worked very, very well because what they said was, even though this is multiple broadcasters, the lead broadcaster, which was Rye, was going to be the one predominantly giving notes. And, and they, they would filter through the notes from their partners to us. And uh, so, it, you didn't feel like this was, you know, TV by committee. You felt like you had a, a very clear direction from from Rye and great strong relationship. And then occasionally we'd speak directly to France Television, but not not very often, honestly. Um, and so I felt like we were really able to stay close to our passion 
and the core vision that my, my co-creator Steve Thompson and I had for the show. So to me, that's a model of how it, it should work. And I think the show it had a larger budget than most um, linear broadcasters have. Um, and it, it looks, you know, it looks like it could compete with anything on the streaming platforms. Yes, absolutely right. And I'm sure that Vance can add something to that because he has both sides experience as well from major TV uh, to the new players today. Yeah, let me, I, I do, I'll make a distinction for the viewers that I think will be helpful to them is that you have, um, uh, the, good, the good news is you have an explosion of need. Uh, the viewing of te television worldwide is way up and uh, due to that, you have these huge streamers. Uh, you have the you know, the Netflixes of the world. They're, they're spending lots and lots of money, millions of dollars. I mean, we're talking over ten million dollars per episode now on some of these big budget miniseries and episodic shows, where that um, the the Amazons and Apple and Netflix are competing in a rarefied strata, um, strata where they are buying out all rights. And they're going to producers to, in essence, deliver to them a show, which they will then worry about marketing. And they actually tell my producers that I represent that they say, listen, you take care of the story. Don't even worry about it. We'll take care of the marketing. We'll take care of, of the distribution worldwide. Um, the, but the, the distinction is there's also then, there's a lot, a whole host of extremely competitive broadcasters like Frank was mentioning ZDF and, and you have uh, German broadcasters and um, in English broadcasters and in France paying a lot of money, millions of dollars per episode for only distinctive rights regarding their particular territories, allowing the producer then to sell off and to sell the product in other territories, including the U.S. Um, and there's U.S. also streamers that are of a smaller reach, the stars of the world, epics, uh, very good buyers who want those original content um, productions, which they can buy and uh, hopefully buy because another country has come up with the, either a broadcast or another service has come up with the, the, the necessary money to produce this big story. So it's, it's put together as more of like, uh, Frank was mentioning, more of the international co-production format uh, by piecing the, together the different territories, which enables the producer to make a lot more money, typically, than they can for just supplying the product to a Netflix or to another um, a big, mm -hmm. big streamer that's paying a license fee for worldwide rights. Two very distinctive ways that a producer can look at this and the market is extremely viable now. The competition is so fierce for content. Since you say, just say that the competition is fierce and there are a lot, the landscape is so larger than before. Do you think that the audience now is more able and open to other, uh, to other way of lives, lives? Oh. Uh, so dramatically, it's true. I mean, in America, we're actually we're having you know such a self-discovery of our own um, native cultures, um, and this this tolerance. Hopefully, hopefully, tolerance we're building for other cultures. It definitely extends to international cultures as well. And listen, you know, as horrific as the COVID pandemic has been worldwide. And so many millions of lives have been lost due to it. I, I do want to point out what it has also contributed to was a massive increase in viewing of television. These people are cloistered in their homes and they're dying for content. And they've had to reach beyond the normal resources to get that content. And they've opened up, as it's clearly been seen, to see these international productions. I mean, there's one really good recent example. Look what happened at Money Heist, a uh, Spanish yeah. production uh, that was uh, relatively successful. Netflix then uh, dubbed it internationally, sold it internationally. It became a monolithic hit absolutely over the top and how many viewers it had worldwide because again global story it's a bank heist but they told it extremely well and extremely compelling um but i don't think that would have been discovered in an earlier time it's just a, it's a, it's the timing is right this the the acceptance level from people 
to accept all sorts of cultures. Again, as so long as a story can be internationally and broadly um, adapted, a money heist is the best example. But there are many more now that are happening where people want to see great, good content stories of different cultures. And even period dramas like the ones that Frank produces, like I Medici or Leonardo, we can see a a period story but yet is so modern so refreshing so relevant not judgmental of any kind of uh, race languages and i mean it's so um, uh, embracing the diversity of today's what do you think frank is yeah and i have to say you know i had never done a period show before uh medici unless you count man in the high castle which i don't really and um, it's always hard. It's always hard getting people to buy into period shows. The first thing they say is we don't want it. And yet they cut through. Like, so that, what's interesting to me, and this again is about the traditional broadcasters in Europe, is that they're very um, conservative. And uh, the audiences for most of the traditional broadcasters have got quite old. And I think, you know, what I'm hoping is going to happen, and I think we are starting to see it happen, is because of the pressure from the streamers, the traditional broadcasters are having to take more chances and uh, creatively be a little more daring and find things that um, not just speak to their traditional audience, but engage a younger audience as well. And I think, you know, that's, again, it's, it's a, it is the, the best time ever in, in television. And as everybody else is saying, it's particularly the best time ever in European television. I mean, it's nothing short of a revolution that's happening and we're in the midst of it. And it's creating all kinds of new opportunities for new storytelling. And um, I think it's really important that the traditional broadcasters stay vital and healthy and that they, they find ways to engage with younger viewers. I, I, I love the streamers, but I don't want the traditional broadcasters to go away. I think that competition is essential. Mm -hmm. And so um, I hope that the success of shows like Medici and Leonardo um, it continues to encourage traditional broadcasters to take more chances and to um, do shows that reach younger audiences, which both of those series um, did. You know, you're so correct. It's such a great opportunity to tell you to say that what there's never been a better time and more important role for the Monte Carlo TV festival to play than right now. In this time when we were seeing such an explosion of international uh, productions and uh, the acceptance worldwide of international programming and the, the dominance now of European co-productions. So uh, the, fe the festival is in the best place it's, I think it could ever be. Absolutely. And on the other end, there are other period dramas like Cable Gears or Freud. They're still are appealing to younger audience as well because they are modern and fresh. The look is in the, in the period drama, but yet the uh, the message is very universal, very relevant, not judgmental at all, and very fresh. So, I, yeah, I think I mean you know you were you were saying that Frank and 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 I mean you know without the public broadcasters we wouldn't have done Freud. You know yeah. we the, the the first one on board was ORF. You know public broadcaster. Uh, to do Freud with us, and uh, uh, yes, it is very successful for Netflix. But um, you know, it was uh, money from from two public broadcasters, meaning um, ORF and ZDF, and Netflix uh, to make it happen. And you know, we we talked to Netflix um, whether whether we wanted to make this uh, Netflix original, and we would have been. Uh, absolutely up for that as well but um, at the end of the day um, the the decision was was made between all of us between all of the partners that that it made the most sense um, to 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 do it as a as a Netflix co-production rather than as a Netflix original mm -hmm. and um, you, you know you were saying earlier that's the best way uh, to do it for for the producers absolutely because the you know the first territory that gets sold afterwards is already, uh, you know, money coming in rather than mm -hmm. money paying for the budget. So, so we are absolutely happy with that as well. Um, uh, you know, the, the our, our partners at Satel and, and and us, but but it's also interesting that again a public broadcast show, you know, was one that Netflix wanted to partner on, just like they have done so many times. I mean. 
um, you know, you look at the big uh, shows that, that are on Netflix, they, they are either done with uh, British public broadcasters or Spanish yeah. public broadcasters or German public broadcasters. The public broadcasters still have, uh, you know, their fingers on the pulse of their home territories uh, in a way that, that Netflix doesn't yet. Um, I mean, obviously, they are building their, their local teams, yeah. you know, they, they are hiring public broadcaster editorials to come and work for them in addition to other ones obviously yes. but um, it, you know it's it's still they are still there and they're still relevant and I think that um, you know it would be a great shame if if uh, you know they were to go away because I think it's good to to have a you know a challenging a, a time where where Netflix or Amazon gets challenged by the different public broadcasters of Europe I think that's you know it's it's important because it it is what changed the landscape. Now the, the, the productions of the individual countries are becoming better and better because yeah. there is more competition for talent. And so talent can develop better and we have more money and we can, we can tell better stories. As you say, Netflix, for instance, is relying on local productions that does international shows like Bamboo that has produced the the first Spanish show. It was a period show. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. And again, it's a period show. Yeah, but Still it was a special kiss me because, uh, as I mentioned before, we had two titles. We had Gran Hotel and Belve, and both of them were huge internationally, and both of them were period shows. So when Netflix came to Spain, they asked for something like that. It's true that Bamboo built the company with that base we 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 produce a strong romance in period time so we're still doing that now the show that we are producing for amazon is not their first show in spain but mm -hmm. it's our first show for them for them it's, yeah it's again period is 1948 it's a couple of, of it's like Sherlock and Watson but okay. it's, it's like a young girl with his butler with her butler and they're going to to investigate one crime and it's 1948 so um, we have a different experience in Spain it's true that when we were trying to go for example Apple or something like that they, it's like more American spirit they ask for contemporary stories yeah. but in Spain we have a strong success uh, in doing and producing period and in, in our case, a special case, Bamboo Producciones have like that brand about period and romance stories. So for us, it's easier than for others to sell that kind of story. Because yet they are universal. They feel, they feel modern. Yeah. Couple girls, I mean, we, can uh, be a girl of yeah. today. Yeah, but for this, is, this is like the point, is how you assume that period show is. Yeah. Because at, uh, uh, before with the public channel in Spain, when you take a story from the past, you must do like a portrait, a, a very well document documented you know <laughs> sorry it's like with a strong identity and, yeah. and connected with the past in a real way yeah. and now um, something that we're living with the with the with the networks or with with Amazon with the platforms or with with Netflix more than all uh, they always um, want to be far from uh, voices that are not yeah Act, uh, contemporary for example the reaction about um, uh, uh, the the um, one homosexual relations mm -hmm. uh, or, 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 or is, is something about one voice about one woman who is like hiding because yeah. of her husband is how you tell that story is you cannot give like the the things that we consider now that is not it's, it's not it's not good to tell like yeah. there's this opportunity they don't want to to tell it's like avoid voices that don't give us contemporary and that avoid the voices that cannot be close to the young people yeah. or the free people or the freedom mind they 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 provoke that you choose the story that can be contemporary but 
in the context of the past, you know? It's yeah, like the LBGT artists yes, you put on so cable strong. girls. And cable you girls. You, you For example, in cable girls, we have that experience with two girls fall in love with the other. And we said, in Spain, in the 20s, yeah. we can imagine that all not all the people are going to approve this situation. And they say, okay, I don't want to tell the story about that people. Yeah. I want to tell the story about the people who push them to be together. Absolutely. So, this is the point and here. And to accept all the, the exterior change, because of course now we are talking about transgender, LGBTQ yes. yeah. uh, but rights, Spain, but back then... It there was a, 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 is, 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 is a, a country, in that moment the, the, the women are growing, were yeah. growing, and, and they were uh, having their first job and blah blah, but it was it was not it was not not possible to imagine that in a group of five women one of them don't reject that yeah but they said okay i don't like to tell that story i want to tell the the the, the story with the support and with the and that's that's what the audience appreciate the same happened for the for leonardo recently there was a huge conversational this conversation sorry international about the uh, leonardo sexuality and how it was approached with a very sensitive modern delicate way and yet it was relevant the way you portrayed Yes, and, and that's the thing, this prejudice against period shows that I find infuriating because Europe obviously is so rich in history and there's so many amazing stories and it is the culture here. And what we tried to do with both Leonardo and Medici was translate the past to the present, especially to young people today, to show them how these people who lived 500 years ago were like them in many ways and faced many of the same issues and what they went through. And it's inspiring and it and it gives you a sense of connection to your to your past and your country and, and makes you proud, you know, of your heritage. And I, I just think this idea that period is old fashioned yeah. is wrong. You know, it's actually this unbelievable resource that I think it's foolish to turn away from. So and I think, you know, the success of, of these shows proves it because these are the shows that really have reached young people, you know, and they're, um, they're about people who, who've been dead for centuries, you know, um, but you, you pull out the threads of their lives that um, reflect the, the lives that young people are leading today. And um, it's very exciting. Look at a series like uh, The Crown, which is exploding in America. I mean, that's a very good example of how you, you can temporize an older story, right, a whole love story, love yeah. stories, and you make it uh, feel very, very uh, fresh and new to the younger viewers. And it's doing extremely well in the ratings uh, yeah, with the young demos. A very old story, but no, it's not. It's a very current story. It's a love story. Yeah, because it's not to you, Mike. Just for clarity, when I, when, I, when I was saying in the beginning about, yeah. you know, getting you know, a lot of the global streamers are, are asking us and asking, wanting our clients to bring contemporary shows. Yeah. That doesn't mean, of course, like some of the biggest hits right now are, are, are shows based in history. Um, and, and they're still buying history. I think my, my point was more that there's, there seems to be a bigger opportunity on the contemporary side because, you know, people, right. companies like Bamboo and people like Frank are obviously doing amazing shows in history. And, and I, I just don't think, especially when it comes to global streamers, that they're seeing enough projects contemporary. So I think that's more was my point is that when it comes to, we're always thinking about, okay, how do we, what gives us the best chance of not only selling, but getting something on the air. And I just think that there's, there seems to be based on, on, on talking to the global streamers and others, a real desire to, to have as many contemporary shows as possible. Again, that doesn't mean they're not going to do this uh, historical shows. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure that the audience sure. have some questions. Yeah. Do you, do you have any questions? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Um, we will bring you the mic. Introduce mm -hmm. yourself. Tell us who you are. Hi, uh, my name is Stan Graziani. I'm a producer. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I was wondering, I heard that uh, all the stre major streamers now have diversity supervisors. 
And I was wondering, when you create a show, uh, maybe for Frank, who's a writer, or, uh, you know, as a producer, uh, does, is that impeding to your creation? Or, I mean, how do you deal with that? If you have, for example, we're talking, we're mentioning period pieces, and you're, you're telling a story that has, that is not diverse enough, you know, for, for today. It has no, maybe no blacks, maybe no, transgender in the story. How do you deal with that? I hear many people now uh, find it difficult to um, questions that we would never have asked 10 years ago. Like, for example, what's the gender of the people of the person who's writing, which was irrelevant 10 years ago. And today it's becoming you have quotas and stuff like that. How do you deal with that? Uh. Just from my experience, I, I have not had any diversity uh, executive or supervisor uh, whatsoever. But from my point of view, you know, this is a really welcome and long overdue change in the industry that, um, you know, for years I personally found resistance when I tried to cast people of color or tell stories about marginalized communities. And now it's gone the opposite direction, you know. Now the same people who were saying no to me only five years ago are the ones insisting, you know, you've got to have uh, women directors and people of color and stories about uh, marginalized communities, which I think is is great. And I think it's important for these people, these people who've been underrepresented, to see themselves on screen and to be able to tell their own stories. And I fully support all of that. Not every show is going to do that, you know, not every show is going to lend itself to that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Medici has virtually n no characters of color in it, and there's yeah. very few in, in Leonardo as well, although there's, yeah. you know, obviously a, a gay protagonist in that story. Um, but I think you see shows like, you know, Bridgerton or Spanish Princess that are being very imaginative. Uh, you know, just like Hamilton was on Broadway, you know, mm -hmm. they're finding ways to reinvent history from a multicultural point of view. I don't think that's going to be every show. I don't think it should be every show, but I think it's fabulous that that's part of the, the mix. Um, I think, you know, this is a, a period of change we're going through right now, and it's, um, it's opening up opportunities, and it's going to have a positive influence on all the young people who are watching TV now to see these stories and see themselves represented. And I think we all, you know, we're, we're finding, we're still finding the best way to support this, but I think we should all be supporting it. Totally agree with you, Frank, well said. I think, I think what you said that we should support it is, is definitely right. And, and finding the best way is, I think, still something that is slightly unclear. And it's, I think it's unclear to a lot of us. I think that, you know, a, um, a movement that says gay characters should be played by gay actors is, is interesting. But what does that mean? Does that mean that anyone who doesn't want to reveal their sexuality can't be chosen for such a part? Even if we know um, privately that they might be gay, we can't use them because then we would mm -hmm. make it public that they are. I think those uh, topics are, are relevant and they it's it's great that we all talk about it but we also need to be careful that we are not um, making it mandatory for everyone to mm -hmm. say what they do in their homes because that's not what we want I don't think we want to create the um, you know to make actors have to say what they like sexually mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and I think that that is where it potentially goes too far, but mm -hmm. I do think that we need to have more characters that, that are of minority, and it's very good that that is being asked for. The question is how do you implement it without it becoming um, a, 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 you know, ticking boxes is not what we want television to be. We need mm -hmm. to make it so that it doesn't feel as if a box was ticked. And I think if you, if you watch television now, that works oftentimes. You don't notice, you know, I think something like Euphoria, for instance, is a fantastic example. Mm -hmm. It has characters from all walks of life, yeah. but it mm -hmm. is not about that. It's not making that the topic of the show. And so it works really well. I think Mayor of Easttown, if you, if you look yeah. at that, multicultural, you know, you've got mm -hmm. all sorts of, of, of characters. The, 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 you know, the daughter is lesbian. 
Yeah. No one ever talks about her being lesbian. Why should they? She's lesbian. She's not strange. And I think that if you do it that way, then it's fantastic. If you yeah. start to say, oh, if I don't have a lesbian daughter in my show, the show won't be made, well, then we have a problem. No, but I think there's yeah. no, like, I, to I focus right. on that is, like, to, to tell if it's not a lesbian or not, but if it's, like, maybe in all your characters can be one lesbian that we're not talking about that, but it's going to be there. Because in our culture, the, we are we we are a community that they were like always taking or we were the industry was taking for years pictures about like hom homogeneous or like a it's like a, the the heterosexual life and 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 it's stupid because around us we are we have all the people like you have people in your family or friends so not all the people is telling if they have relations with men or women but they are they are uh, they, they they have if they need if they're going to fall in love for example my issue is that she is not she's going to she's going to speak about her sexuality no but if she's going to fall in love i need to know that is with one woman for example uh, in terms of right in terms of of of, of, of to give voices in the script is, I think, is depends of. I never work with a diversity Divorce. supervisor. I never that uh, do that. But I think that there's a value, and it's going, of course, to to not all the the stories can have all kind of uh, representation. Because if you are going to tell the story about monks, you cannot probably have female people. So uh, you you. But is how if you are going to tell the story about one village, why cannot be a lesbian there? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying there can't be. I'm. I'm just. It, and I think it's very interesting what you were saying earlier that Netflix didn't want uh, it to become a topic um, that that someone might be against a lesbian relationship. I think that is something that I mean we were talking about that on season two of Das Boot whether we wanted a, a gay character in uh, in the U boat. Um, and we decided not to do it because if there would be a gay character in the U-boat and we would treat it as if that is normal, we would really rewrite history. And I don't think that is right no. too. I think you of cannot course. just not make it a topic. And if you make it a topic, well then that show suddenly is about, about a that. gay yeah. person yeah. in a U-boat. Sure. And you have to be very careful with these things. We talked about it very, very long with the network. The network was really open to doing it. But at the end of the day, we decided, no, it's, it's just going to be much too big a, a topic. Mm -hmm. And we can't really tell the story no, no. anymore that we want For to sure. tell. So, you know, we cannot force this. We can't story. force it. We no, can't no. force it. Anymore. But they're going to green light the shows that they mm -hmm. um, want to push or not to that kind of thing. So if they said, I need a show, sometimes we receive these kind of things. I need a show with a strong identity in that or in mm -hmm. that. Or n right now, I'm really focusing to find the story who tells something about these kind of problems or this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, little things that nobody tells. But of course, when you green light or when you have the Medici or when you, is, mm -hmm. the, the story is going to tell you what you can tell or not. And the way and the tone is something that you can manage. You have to do, absolutely. And we have also two questions from the audience. I, I'm going to read it. The first one is from Christina Antunes. Did film stop completely in any moment in the USA due to COVID? How is the coming back to some normality going on? And is there any publication we can read about it? To our US panelists. Well, filming did not stop. Um, it, it certainly was slowed down tremendously, but producers are extremely, the most inventive people in the world and found ways <laughs> to, to produce. Um, movies during COVID uh, isolated. I mean, there's many good examples. They've either picked up stories that were able to be produced that way, um, or they went to environments where it was um, was safe, was made safe either by uh, safety protocols, or they went to certain countries where their protocols were already you know, in existence. Um, uh, 
so it, it didn't stop. That's that's the answer. Uh, I would recommend um, that there are some places you can go. Uh, even to the Producers Guild of America, we have some very vibrant uh, protocols, safety protocols, a white paper that we've published. But there are many other places as well where they, they talk about what it, it takes to make a production um, COVID safe, uh, with, with what practices should be followed. Um, but as we're coming out of it now and the um, vaccinations are becoming more predominant, um, there really is uh, an explosion of more production absolutely happening now because of that and the need for more programming. We, we had to shut down Leonardo last March because of COVID uh, in, in Rome. And then uh, we had to sort of do some rewrites and, and change our production schedule. And then we were able to resume, thank goodness, in June of last year. And we finished uh, without interruption in August. Um, so it, it's, it's just as, as he's saying, as Vance is saying, is there are ways around it. Um, and, and I'm shooting another show currently in Rome and London um, that, that has had no shutdowns, even though I falsely positive. I tested falsely positive for COVID and scared the hell out of me. Um, so um, yeah, we're able to move forward again, thank goodness. And we have another question from Tina Bianchi via Zoom. She asked, do you think the business model of the streamers could have shortened the lifespan of a product? Once in the library, a product doesn't have any platform to go to? Netflix, I can jump in here. I mean, Netflix in particular has been upfront about thinking that 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 shows like the, the the prime number of seasons for good shows is three. So I think they've they've been open to the fact that once a lot of their shows, once they reach a certain season, it becomes a little bit more diminishing returns to keep them going. Now, if you have a show that's a cultural hit and is at yeah. one of those you know top top levels, they're of course going to keep. Um, the series going as long as possible but but most shows are not most shows are not yeah. at the very top um and there are a lot of really good shows that i think yeah unfortunately netflix i think it's it's after about season two or season three mm -hmm. it definitely becomes less of a priority for them to to keep these shows going unfortunately i think that is i think that's something that you know it, it it's becoming more and more um relevant for producers that that is their business model, that even if they are still successful with uh, season three, that they won't commission season four. Um, and, and I think that that's something that, that people will start to look into when they have IP that they can take elsewhere. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, um, longevity is, is something that, that we're all going for because uh, the the amount of money and energy that goes into creating new shows yeah. is tremendous, and um, and it's and obviously it's also a question of return on investment because all the shows that you develop that never get made need to be amortized by yeah. those shows that have a very long lifespan, and if the lifespan is cut short from the start with you know platforms, then either they have to pay more from the start yeah. in order to amortize the amount of money that That's producers right. have to put in to develop. Or there has to be other ways uh, yeah. of, of, of you know, re re remuneration because it, it doesn't work um, otherwise. It's an interesting, it's an interesting dilemma. And it, it also starts to raise the question of what is a TV series? And, yeah. you know, it, you, we, we're sort of still operating in the old model, the old broadcast model in a streaming environment. And I think we're going to start to see, you know, the definition of what a TV series already, you know, it's going to start to blur between that and movie storytelling. And I think we're going to see new formats, you know, things that are designed to have a certain lifespan. Uh, but it's a separate issue how that impacts upon the economics of independent producers like, you know, Moritz and, and, and Big Light. It's like, you know, we count on shows that return uh, to make it economically viable to to operate, and um, it's that's a challenge if, if the streaming platforms only want to show for three or four years. You know, in success. Would you like to add something? No, no. I think okay. I... So, if I don't know if there are any other questions from the audience, otherwise we. We can thank all these amazing panelists today. So once again, thank you, Teresa Fernandez-Valdez, Moritz Polter, Frank Spotnitz, 
Vance Van Patten and Grant Kesman. Thank you so much for being here at the Monte Carlo TV Festival, virtually and in person. And thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Really thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Alessandra. And that was great. And for managing that so well, because we have Vance in, uh, you're in LA, um, Frank in Paris and Grant in London and then we have Teresa from Madrid but with us in Monte Carlo <laughs> and we have Moritz from Munich, Munich but in Monte Carlo and Teresa it? is a very international panel from it's from Rome in Italy <laughs> so thank you for joining us um, great panel really insightful very exciting and we hope to see our Rose lovely to see people on in the, the zoom asking questions as well and uh, thank you for coming to us live in person and we will see you back we hope at six o'clock CST, that's uh, still very early for you, Vance, 9am. 9, 9 yeah. <laughs> and that will be the migration from movie theatre to streaming, and we've got a great panel lined up there. So thank you, guys. Thank you all, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.